Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to History 21. Um, I hope you guys can't hear my young neighbor downstairs, that was below me, has a bunch of people out on the driveway. They're hanging out really weirdly because they're like, they all have masks on and are like standing six feet apart. But um, I don't know, so I'm kind of talking loudly as young people do. So hopefully you can't hear that. Um, I really don't want to be like, like, damn you kids, get off of my driveway. Um, but hopefully you just won't be able to hear it. Um, all right. Um, serious question. Should I have my wife shave my head? I really need a haircut. My hair looks really bad as it gets long, especially as it starts to really thin out. And she's afraid to cut my hair, so she just wants to shave it. Um, which is uh, it's a scary prospect. I haven't had a shaved head for a very long time. Um, anyhow, speaking of shaved heads on white people, let's uh, get into some racism. Um, today's lecture is going to be um, about the Black Power Movement, whoops, of the 1960s, uh, and how uh, we left on such a positive note last time with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Um, and the, the latter half of the 60s is really marked by a lot uh, you know, of, of, of a really angry movement uh, coming out of northern and western um, cities of black people who were not seeing those, uh, you know, these sort of legal victories that were, you know, as part of the civil rights movement, not, not helping their life at all. Um, so I want to look at how that came from. Um, we're going to spend a good amount of time here in California because, uh, I turn on the light in here, uh, you know, the Black Panthers uh, begin, you know, right, only blocks from sitting right now. Um, they, they, seriously, like, they, they, I live in the neighborhood the Black Panthers were born. Um, so, and has particular interest to me. So uh, here are our learning goals. I hope you guys are keeping up on. Uh, this is another kind of, you can tell by the number of learning goals here. This is kind of another big lecture that's gonna be broken into two parts. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about losing um, part of it or anything like that, like I did last time. But I really only wanna give this lecture once. Uh, so we're gonna jump around a bit in time uh, today. I'm gonna kind of start uh, at the end, like, you know, with the Black Panthers, uh, you know, at least halfway through, you know, the, their peak. Um, for, for, I'm gonna start with Angela Davis for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, Angela Davis was never a member of the Black Panthers, but she did have sort of close ties with them. Um, and she's sort of a good person to start with for two reasons. Um, for one, uh, something insane happens involving her and it gives you an idea of just how weird things were in the late 1960s and early 70s. Uh, and also she uh, makes a good argument for why passive resistance, nonviolent resistance was um, started feeling like less of an option for a lot of people. So um, the thing about, so Angela Davis, you would not think of being a controversial figure. She was a college professor uh, at UCLA and UC Santa Cruz. Um, she was a, the leader of the Communist Party of America. She's very open about being a, a communist. And um, in this, uh, I should be, instead of beginning with her, I should really start in, uh, in the summer of 1970, Marin County, very close to where we all are right now, uh, very mellow, uh, affluent, white uh, Marin County, uh, a 17-year-old named Jonathan Jackson uh, burst into a courtroom and held the entire courtroom hostage. Um, at, at the county courthouse, there was uh, three black prisoners that were accused of killing a prison guard at San Quentin. Um, San Quentin's in Marin County. So uh, they're accused of killing this guy when they're on trial for that. You know, they've already committed crimes and they're on trial for this extra crime of, of possibly killing this prison guard. and. Um, in the middle of the trial, the 17-year-old kid busts into the room with a shotgun and holds the entire room hostage. Um, they make demands to the police. 
uh, and get a van uh, to be able to escape in. And they come out and Josh, uh, Jonathan Jackson and uh, the three prisoners and they have the judge uh, with them. He said they're holding the judge hostage as they escape. And they get in the van and start driving away. And as they're driving away, the police don't want to let them get away and just open fire into the van. Um, and kill uh, Jackson, kill two of the inmates, and kill the judge. Um, so, you know, however you question, you know, how smart it was for the police to do that, um, Everybody was very angry, uh, you know, that this judge had been killed. All the blame didn't, you know, go on the police. It went on the, um, on this Jonathan Jackson, who turned out had had uh, connections to the Black Panthers and connections to his college professor, Angela Davis. Uh, it came out later on that uh, Jackson had worked for Davis uh, for a little bit. Um, and she had originally bought the shotgun that he used at the crime. She didn't have it anymore and claimed to have no um, knowledge of it. She, had, she hadn't seen it for years. She had given it to somebody and then at some other point it had got, gotten onto uh, in the Jackson's hands and that's the crime that he used. But based off of that, um, Angela Davis was accused of aggravated kidnapping and, fir and first degree murder of Judge Harold Harley, which is just insane. She, she wasn't anywhere. She was in Los Angeles when this crime in Marin County uh, happened and had no prior knowledge of it. Nobody even suspected that necessarily she did have prior knowledge of it, or I guess, they, 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 you know, they thought she might, but, you know, it was a very tenuous connection. Um, but she's accused of, you know, kidnapping a first degree murder of a judge. Um, and she, you know, she's like, she knows she feels like she might like get a fair trial. So she goes on the run. Um, J. Edgar Hoover puts her on the 10 most wanted list, the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Um, and she, goes, she originally gets arrested. She, uh, she gets captured in a, at a motel in New York City. And um, that night on TV, uh, Richard Nixon congratulates the FBI on their capture of the most dangerous terrorist, Angela Davis, is, you know, is what he calls her. Um, she pleads innocent uh, for this. Um, she spent 16 months in prison, and while she's awaiting, awaiting trial, there's this big campaign to free her. Uh, all these people talk about how unjust it is. Um, John Lennon and Yoko ono, Yoko ono even write a song uh, called Angela uh, that's about her, and you know how she should be freed. She eventually was freed. She, she ended up having to they move the trial to San Mateo County because uh, she wouldn't be able to get a fair one in Marin. Um, it was an all-white jury, uh, and they found her not guilty. Uh, so. I bring up this story because this is bonkers. This is such an insane thing to happen. Um, things are, we live in weird times right now, but you know, we don't have teenagers taking judge hostages and cops, you know, killing judges and then, you know, accusing college professors and just, that is just a weird thing to be happening. Uh, so that gives you just a sense of what things were like uh, in, in, in the late 60s and early 70s. And that's gonna play into keep that in mind um, in today's lecture, like, you know, like, sort of just crazy things are happening and just sort of how people um, took it and were frightened by the world that they lived in. Uh, it was this kind of scary time to leave in, live in. People really felt like the social fabric that, you know, that ties society together uh, was unraveling. Uh, I'm also, also bringing up Davis because I'm going to play you a clip uh, here of uh, Davis, uh, in an interview, this is, this is a few years later, I think this is 1972, um, and she talks about uh, growing up in Alabama. She talks about that guy, Bull Connor, that I talked about in the last lecture, uh, and uh, you know, why you know, armed resistance you know, began to feel like an option. Um, if you have uh, seen the movie uh, The 13th, on Netflix. I thought about maybe, nah, I don't know. I might still have you guys watch that. I don't know. Um, we'll see how things go. Um, I, I found, I originally saw this clip uh, there. This is a longer version of, of, of the clip that uh, that's in that movie. Uh, that's not the one we want. Okay, this is it here. You can definitely tell it's the 1970s. Um, a year ago, 
The Black Panthers were much more active. You heard much more about that type of, of struggle. Is the time of the Black Panthers past? The Black Panthers still exist, and the Black Panthers are still extremely active in, in the Oakland community and in communities all over the country. I'm not sure whether you are aware of what is now um, happening in the Black Panther Party and the kinds of things that members of, the, of that party are, are doing no, now. No, tell me. First of all, if you're going to talk about a revolutionary situation, you have to have people who are physically able to wage a revolution, who are physically able to organize and physically able to do all that is done. No, yeah, but the question is, more, how do you get there? You get there by confrontation, violence? Oh, is that the question you were asking? Yeah. See, that's, I mean, that's another thing. When you talk about a revolution, most people think violence um, without realizing that the real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for, not in the way you reach them. On the other hand, uh, because of the way this society is organized because of the violence that exists on the surface everywhere. You have to expect that there are going to be such explosions. You have to expect things like that as reactions. If you are a black person and live in, 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 in the black community all your life and walk out on the street every day seeing white policemen surrounding you. I, when I was living in Los Angeles, for instance, long before the situation in LA ever occurred, uh, I was constantly stopped. No, the, the police didn't know who I, who I was, but I was a black woman. I had, had a natural, and, and they, I suppose, thought that I might be a, quote, militant. And when you live under a situation like that constantly, um, uh, and, and then you ask me, you know, whether I approve of violence. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, whether I approve of guns. I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, some very, very good friends of mine were killed by bombs, bombs that were planted by racists. Uh, I remember from, from the time I was very small, I remember the sounds of bombs exploding across the street, our house shaking. I remember my father having to have guns at his disposal at all times because of the fact that at any moment, uh, uh, someone we, we might expect to be attacked. The man who was at that time in con complete control of the city government, his name was Bull Connor, uh, would often get on the radio and make statements like, uh, 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 niggas have moved into a white neighborhood, uh, we better expect some bloodshed tonight. And sure enough, there would be bloodshed. Uh, after the four young girls who were, who lived very, who lived, one of them lived uh, next door to me, and, I was very good friends with the sister of, of another one. My, my sister was very good friends with all three of them. My mother taught one of them in a class. My mother, in fact, when the bombing occurred, one of the mothers of uh, one of the young girls called my mother and said, uh, can you take me down to the church to pick up uh, Carol? I, you know, we heard about the bombing and I, and I don't have my car. And they went down and what did they find? They found limbs and heads strewn all over the place. And then after that, uh, in my neighborhood, all of the men organized themselves into an armed patrol. They had to take their guns and patrol our community every night because they did not want that to happen again. I mean, that's why when someone asked me about violence, uh, uh, I, just, uh, I just find it incredible. It, because it, what it means is that the person who's asking that question has absolutely no idea what black people have gone through, what black people have experienced in this country since the time the first black person was kidnapped from the shores of Africa. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, like, that's... Uh, it's a, you know white people in this country would long be confused about why um, you know well, why this armed violence you know and I, and I think she you know, she gives a pretty good answer um, you, you, you know for that like you know like, these people have lived with violence for so long um, are all of a sudden accused of starting the violence um, yeah I think you know I'm not condoning any 
anything you know that that, that was done in, in violent actions. Uh, there's definitely going to be some messed up stuff, you know, coming from the Black Panthers. Um, but you can definitely understand the anger and the impulse uh, there. Um, so, you know, like like I said last week, we jumped off of the Civil Rights Act. This is uh, basically the same slide that was there uh, last week, but now we just see um, Martin Luther King shaking uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson's hand. Um, you know, this was, you know, a huge victory. Um, this, of course, was not uh, enough. This is, you know, this helps end, you know, segregation in, in many different uh, areas, you know, most specifically places in the South that had legal segregation. This helps end uh, segregation in those places. Um, it still wasn't enough for voting. The next year, they passed the Voting Rights Act, which ends up, you know, being incredibly important. You know, it outlaws, you know, restrictions aimed at minority groups. Um, there are you know, things like poll taxes and literacy tests, that, you know, like the, the 1964 Civil Rights Act say, oh, you can't uh, discriminate against people and voting based on race. Um, well, we already saw that, you know, they found ways around that already uh, in the South. They would have, you know, they didn't have to say anything about race that is sort of unfair in how they give people the test. So uh, this makes it a lot harder for um, Southern states to uh, you know, to have those kind of policies. They basically put, put a thing in this clause saying that any, any of those states, if they, they change their voting laws, they have to get approval uh, from the U U.S. government to be able to do that. Um, and actually that part is, has just changed. In the last couple of years, the Supreme Court went back and took this part of the Voting Rights Act out. And now we start seeing a bunch of new racial discrimination um, cases you know, sh showing up in the South. Um, and it, it, the Supreme Court's, you know, the majority ruling, they decided like, oh, well, you know, we haven't had any problems with, you know, minority voting rights in these states um, over the years, so everything must be fine now. Uh, and dissenting, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote, uh, you know, this is like saying, you know, wondering why you're not getting wet uh, during the rain because you have an umbrella up and deciding, well, I'm not getting wet now, so I might as well close the umbrella. And that's pretty much, you know, what they did uh, to you know, those states, they took away those protections, and sure enough, here comes a bunch of new racist policies. Um, so, you know, so the 1964 Civil Rights Act was, wasn't enough. Um, you definitely have, uh, I'm not going to talk much about Malcolm X. Um, I have another video here that you can watch later if you, you want for the sake of time. I'm not going to play it right now. Um, but he's definitely somebody that, um, where are we at it? Uh, will be much more inspirational to, to the angry people in, um, you know, that, that are feeling left out of the, you know, this, the civil rights movement uh, and any victories that they're having, Malcolm X becomes a more appealing leader. Um, and X is somebody, you know, he was never advocating for violence necessary. He's a misunderstood person in American history that people uh, say like, oh, he, you know, he was advocating for armed overthrow of the American government and stuff like that. He didn't do that. Um, what he was saying that like that black people needed to defend themselves um, by any means necessary like right? basically you know they, they're being attacked by oppressive violence and they need to be able to defend themselves with that um, he also had other ideas you know he felt like you know black freedom would not be given uh, or should not be given it cannot be given by white legislatures like, uh, what Martin Luther King's route is asking for white people to change their laws um, and Malcolm X had this sort of philosophy of, um, you know, we need to, we can improve our lives and carve out our own futures. They, you know, it, they don't have the right to tell us um, how to live either way. Um, it's not as practical as Martin Luther King's message, but it is a, 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 like, you know, they, they, trying to live in a society where you are just basically saying, I, I don't need to obey these laws anymore. Um, it, it's not a sustainable, uh, you know, method of protest, um, which is part of why the black power movement is not going to work necessarily, but, um, you can definitely see why it would be appealing to, uh, you know, to, to angry young black people. Um, so, um, and Malcolm, you know, has lots of sort of great quotes, um, along the way. Uh, be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone, but if someone puts their hand on you, send them to the cemetery. 
Um, I think, you know, sort so of gets what he's saying. Um, nobody can give you freedom. Nobody can give you equality or justice or anything. You have, to, if you're a man, you have to take it. Um, if you're not careful, um, the newspapers will have you hating the people uh, who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. I think that's, uh, that's, that's, pr that's a pretty prescient one. And X was a, uh, uh, he, he had, you know, he'd been a criminal as a young man. Uh, his name is Malcolm Little. And I uh, grew up in Detroit. Um, he went to prison for burglary uh, at age 21. And there encountered the teachings of the Nation of Islam and converted to, uh, it's not just that it's Islam, it's a very particular sect of Islam, which actually the Nation of Islam um, is considered very much outside of the traditional Islamic structure. Um, you don't have Middle Eastern, Sunni or um, Shiite leaders, both will completely disavow the Nation of Islam, which is much more of a thing in the West. Um, but anyway, um, that will that'll get to sort of why Malcolm X doesn't like them very much. Um, and, you know, he, uh, uh, X, he, he changes his last name from Little to X, like all, all the members of the Nation of Islam did, being of the idea of that, you know, Little was a name slave owners had given to his ancestors. And so, you know, seeing that as a slave name, X was the, like, a, you know, being like, I don't have a last name uh, anymore. And... Uh, the leader was a guy named Prophet Elijah Muhammad, um, who actually started to see Malcolm X as something of a threat because he was getting more famous and popular within the Nation of Islam than him. Um, and he you know, doesn't like him very much. Uh, Malcolm X becomes disillusioned with the Nation of Islam because uh, he finds out Elijah Muhammad had been cheating on his wife, um, you know, basically sinful behavior. Um, there was an instance when, um, uh, in 1961, the, the LAPD harassed a crowd of uh, Nation of Islam uh, followers out in front of their temple in Los Angeles, and uh, which resulted in the cops firing into the crowd and killing seven people. And Malcolm X thought, like, we need to respond with violence. Like, we should go to war with the LAPD. Like, we're, like we, we've been saying all of this sort of rhetoric. We need to put that into action. And Elijah Muhammad was like, no, no, no. I'm, we can't do that. We, we talk a big game, but we don't actually, we're not really going to do that. Um, and then, so at that point, X goes on this sort of journey. He goes to Mecca, uh, sees how like actual um, Muslims live and says like, you know, the Nation of Islam isn't doing that. So he leaves the Nation of Islam and um, founds his, his organization for Afro-American unity, uh, which has all these kind of socialist ideas. Um, and this is, X really starts to get more progressive and thoughtful about his stuff. He starts advocating less for violence um, at that point. I, um, but he, he also ends up being uh, killed uh, relatively quickly by three gunmen from the Nation of Islam. Um, uh, it, it, it was thought, you know, the common story was, you know, they, they didn't like him going out and building his, old power, his own power base out of there, but it is sort of suspicious that uh, the, the FBI had, um, an FBI agent had met with the three assassins from the Nation of Islam who, the night before they killed Malcolm X. Um, so uh, the conspiracy theories are not hard to find uh, there. But um, who knows, if he had lived longer, there's probably more he could have done to help lead the Black Power movement into a more effective uh, movement. Um, so uh, why are so many people angry? Like, like I said, you know, the, the, these, all these different laws are passing that's, you know, federal laws that are important in giving people um, the right to vote uh, and, you know, and the out of segregation and things like that. But that only works in places that have explicitly racist laws. Uh, in the South, Jim Crow laws in the South, um, you know, is written into their, you know, you know, in local state, you know, county laws saying, you know, black people can't be here, like, you know, like they're not allowed to use these facilities over here, things like that. So it, it gets rid of all that kind of stuff. Um, and everybody felt good about that. Like, oh, it's so great. You know, like people don't have to get dogs sicked on them and get beaten up uh, anymore by police. And, you know, they're, they're like uh, getting shot with fire hoses and things like that. We don't, they don't see those images on the nightly news anymore. But, 
for so many uh, black people that had lived, that were living in the North and in the West and in cities, they, there was a much more subtle form of racism. It was, there was, it was not this sort of uh, obvious, um, you know, segregation uh, and things like that. They had the same problem. There was still de facto segregation. Um, it was just done in a, in a more subtle way. Um, and by the time you get to the 1960s, uh, you know, people were extremely pissed off. Like all of these families, these are people that had come up in the Great Migration, coming up in the 1920s, 1940s, and 50s, um, moving, you know, with high hopes, moving into cities looking for industrial jobs. But once they get in those neighborhoods, they're basically just stuck. Um, they're not allowed to li live anywhere else. People will not rent to them anywhere else. And the places that they live um, become increasingly overcrowded. They have less city services. Um, crime you know, becomes a big, you have an overpopulated area where people don't have opportunities to uh, like go out and be able to make money. They turn to crime uh, and things like that. So, you know, uh, on top of all that, you start having these riots popping out um, in, uh, in the 1960s, it could become, you know, every big city in America across the North and the West practically has a riot, um, if not multiple riots, um, through the 1960s. And they all began in, the, you know, these sort of ghetto neighborhoods. And ghetto is a word that's sort of fallen out of fashion um, over the years, but like originally it was an Italian word that was used, but, you know, many European countries used it. And it was originally used for basically any neighborhood where a minority group was forced to live. And in Europe, that typically meant uh, Jewish people. Uh, it was usually used in terms of, of Jews who, who were uh, set to live in certain neighborhoods. Sometimes there would even be walls built around those neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, and they couldn't, you know, leave there or definitely couldn't, uh, you know, if they, they might be able to conduct business out, out there and then, then, you know, have to go back. They definitely can't live anywhere else. Um, and by the 1960s, it became obvious that we had our own ghettos in the United States. There might not be walls around it, not officially, you know, it might not be fences uh, saying you can't leave here, and it might not be checkpoints, um, but there were all kinds of systems set in place to make it very hard for black people to definitely live anywhere else and oftentimes even leave there. Um, you know, police see a black person in a white neighborhood and pull them over and they you know, what are you doing here? You know, the only place that you be safe is in, you know, where the acceptable area for black people to live. So you have, you know, people that are stuck in these areas um, because of your know, discriminatory housing policies and everything. Like I said, you know, like less city services, you know, a rise in crime uh, and things like that. Um, and then on top of that, you have a lot of cases of police brutality. Uh, in those areas. Um, it's going to be sort of a running theme. Um, you know, we know this, you know, happening today, riots, you know, tend to happen, you know, almost always as a direct, direct response to some incidents of, of police brutality. It isn't being the spark because police, um, you know, when all these black people had moved into, you know, northern and western cities during the Great Migration, police didn't know how to react to that. You have a lot of these people that are like sort of country people that had grown up um, you know, on a farm somewhere in Arkansas or Louisiana or something like that. And now they're in you know, Chicago or in Oakland and, um, you know, things are very different. Um, and, you know, it, and it was very crowded there. So the police basically didn't feel like, we, we, like the only way to fight back was basically through overwhelming force. And we need to, you know, we need to teach these people a lesson. We need to teach them that we're in charge. Um, and, that becomes the de facto policy. Um, and I'm, we'll get into more of that uh, in a little bit. But you know, so you have race riots, race riots being sparked um, across the North and, uh, and the West. You know, uh, and this is the backdrop that the black power is gonna, gonna rise up against. Um, housing projects um, are another part of, that happens with part of the great migration that at, the, at first it seems uh, like a good idea. So housing project, project, projects began um, not just to serve black migrants, but really like during World War II, there were um, all these industrial jobs popping up uh, in different places. They had to, you know, build all, all of those things, you know, all the, the, the great migration, you, you know, caused, so you do get, you get 
tanks, planes, all that stuff. Uh, in California during World War II, especially, um, you know, in Los Angeles and in Oakland uh, and San Francisco, uh, you know, the war is basically fight being fought on the Pacific Coast. So they're building all, they have shipyards and, you know, uh, like your know, giant airplane hangars and all that stuff going up. And they need people to be able to work in those positions. So just like, you know, there's tons of black people who are going to be looking for those positions, but not just them, really people from all across the country are uh, moving into these big cities, looking for, you know, looking for these industrial jobs, and they're going to get those jobs, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's housing for all of those people. They were, were not, these cities were not equipped um, to all of a sudden have tens of thousands of people show up overnight and look for somewhere to live. So that makes the, you know, causes a huge housing crisis. The, um, uh, the, the, you know, rental market, you know, r rents, you know, go sky high. So the government says we need somewhere for these people to live. We, like if we need them to work in our factories and shipyards, um, why don't we just build up some, uh, you know, communities, we'll build up some buildings or, you know, little centers like, like that you're seeing right here. Uh, and, um, you know, and we'll regulate it, you know, so for all these workers to live. So, and it seems like a good idea. The you know, rents aren't going to be able, aren't going to be able to go up. Uh, and tons of people move into these places. Um, but really quickly, you know, the government does not make a good landlord. The government has lots of things going on, lots of things to do. Governments, you know, tend to, you know, underfund things, especially once the war is over, they're not funding that stuff very well. Um, they're not taking care of these places. Rent doesn't necessarily go up, but the quality of living goes down and down and down. Uh, and they are um, becoming, you know, because uh, it's easier for white people to get opportunities in other places to live. Either they're not discriminated against in housing, whereas black people are. By the 1960s, uh, in Los Angeles, 100% of all the residents are black at these housing projects because they were literally not allowed to move anywhere else. Um, and that's just, you know, in Los Angeles, you know, we also see like in New York City, they have housing projects, like these huge tall buildings um, that uh, are just almost, lawless it, 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 you know it's they're, they're so big and police do not even want to go into those places um because n nobody would take care of them um so uh, you know this is one example of like so how these things you know devolved uh, over time in, in in these neighborhoods um redlining is is really you know a huge part of all of this uh, as a term we've mentioned a few times um so far and there's a few different things that can, redlining can be. Um, it's essentially, you know, if you look up, you know, the definition of it, the practice of denying services to certain neighborhoods with, uh, you know, high levels of minorities or people of color. Um, this can be a bunch of different things. The way I'm mainly going to be focusing on it here is with real estate and how, you know, uh, landlords, Real estate agents, you know, they're, they're all going to go to work like unofficially to make sure um, black people can't rent uh, in other places because white people d don't want them in their neighborhoods. And then they might they'll give these sort of excuses of like, I don't want my property value to go down. So if they move in my property value, will go down. Um, but that's, you know, like that's like some sort of excuse for racism. It's not. Um, you know, is it like, oh, well, you know, I might lose 3% on, on, you know, my piece of land. So therefore, this entire, uh, you know, race of people have to continually see suffer through generations. Um, yeah, it's really not any sort of justification at all. So, you know, it's really good. So keeping the white neighborhoods white and the black neighborhoods black is a form of redlining. But it could also be uh, city governments uh, in deciding how they're going to allocate resources and things like that uh, to schools and school districts. Um, stuff like trash pickup. Uh, so that you, you you know you literally would have less trash men, um, you know uh, less you know people to you know clean up the streets, uh, less street sweeping, you know j j just you know just in that area you know there's all kinds of different things that they're you know transportation buses there'd be less buses going through those areas things like that, um, so that is a form of redlining. You also have you know the private businesses can do this. Um, it, it gets often. Today, uh, you'll see a lot connected to the loan and banking industry. Um, this idea, you know, that uh, you know, black people will 
if they go apply for a loan, their interest rate is going to be much, much higher. Even you could have a white family and a black family who make the same exact amount of money. They'll have the same exact job. Um, but the interest rate, you know, for a loan for that, uh, the black family is much, much higher. Uh, and a lot of times they're going to say, oh, well, that's due to the, the neighborhood that they live in. Um, not, their, not the color of their skin, but what is the neighborhood that they live in? Oh, it's the black neighborhood. So that is, is a form of redlining. Uh, supermarkets not have not being open up in uh, in these neighborhoods is a form of red dining. And you see, that's a private business decision. But they did say like, oh, there's a high crime area. We don't want to have our supermarket in this area. You know, we're, we're afraid of of getting uh, you know robbed and you know shoplifting and stuff like that. But the effect of that uh, over time is like you have these neighborhoods where people, they're called food deserts, where you, literally you cannot get fresh food. You have to travel miles to be able to go to a supermarket or anywhere that's gonna sell produce. You just have corner stores, you know, liquor stores that you know, have basic you know, microwave meals, frozen meals and things like that. Canned food is and like, you know, that's fine for a bit, but you can't live on that all the time. You, like, if you're gonna thrive, you need a healthy diet. Um, so even in this, this sense of dietary stuff, that is you know, a form of redlining. So, the main way we're looking at it, like there's so many different things we could talk about with it, I'm mainly, mainly looking at it in terms of housing uh, policy uh, and, you know, and, be, and being stuck in ghettoized neighborhoods. Uh, again, in California, um, where this has a particular poignancy, um, in 1963, uh, the, first the first black state legislature um, there's a legislator, but first black state legislator, um, a guy named um, William Bryan Rumford, who represented Oakland and Berkeley, um, proposed and got a law passed called the Rumford Act, which made it illegal in California for landlords and realtors to discriminate uh, in housing based on race. They said, you, you cannot look at race when considering somebody's house. Um, and this seemed like uh, something of a victory. Um, however, the next year, um, his opponents made a ballot initiative uh, that would reverse the Rumford Act. You can, you know, we have with Proposition 13, uh, you know, Proposition 8, we have all these different propositions everywhere that everybody votes on as a state. This was Proposition 14. So everybody in the state gets to vote on whether they're going to reverse um, the Rumford Act. And the way they, they you know, the proponents of this phrase, it is like, oh, well, landlords should have the freedom to rent whoever they, they want to, and uh, things like that. You're taking away uh, people's freedom on, you know, who, who they do business with. But really, it's a saying you can't consider race um, when deciding on who to do business with. Um, and everybody knows that is what it is. Uh, and nevertheless, in 1964, um, the uh, voters, 65% of California voters vote yes on Prop 14, um, and that changes the California Constitution to say landlords and realtors can reject any applicants for any reason that they want, and they don't have to explain themselves. So, um, you know, even Ronald Reagan, conservative hero Ronald Reagan, um, who's governor at the time, or who was running for governor when this happened, um, said, you know, Prop 14 was an attempt to give one segment of our population um, the right to express the basic rights. Uh, this is the rights of all their citizens. Wait, I'm reading that right. Um, it was an attempt to give one segment of our population the right to um, express. It was basic. I don't know. I think I read my quote wrong or wrote it down here wrong. So never mind. Stri stri strike that from the record. Um, but anyway. Eventually, in 1966, the, the Supreme Court, uh, the California Supreme Court, would say Prop 14 is unconstitutional. You know, it's a violation of the 14th Amendment, and they, they can't do that. Um, but it still happened, and the black people who live in uh, these neighborhoods were just told, "No, I'm sorry, all of California uh, wants you where you are." Like you, we don't care what conditions are like where you live. Um, we don't want you in our neighborhood. So it's a huge smackdown uh, to people, and especially before it gets repealed, the people in 1964 and 65 were incredibly uh, angry about what was happening, um, and that's going to uh, directly lead to a riot, um, a very famous one in Watts. Uh, and Watts was one of these neighborhoods uh, in Los Angeles that had once you know, started out as its own little town on the outskirts of Los Angeles, and it 
pretty much get absorbed by the rest of the city. And it just happened to be in the 1920s, there was uh, a black real estate agent there who would rent to black people. So it was a very small um, population of black people in California, in Los Angeles at this time. What, 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 you know, a few of them uh, did live there, a lot of them lived in Watts. But it was a nice middle-class neighborhood. Um, and you know, definitely you know, multiracial neighborhood. But the Great Migration happens, and in the 1940s, there's tons of black Southern migrants moving uh, to Los Angeles. Watts is one of the places that seems sort of acceptable for them to live. And of course, the more black people move in, the more white people move out, and it becomes one of these ghettoized neighborhoods. And that's one of the places they build housing projects, stuff like that. It's definitely when they decide where they're gonna build these things, um, it's no accident that they do that in places where black people already live. Um, so, uh, you know, they have all these different housing projects, uh, and, you know, by the 1960s, you know, all the white people are gone, all, all the black people are left are stuck in this getaway neighborhood with, no, with nowhere to go. Um, and, you know, by 1964, you know, you know, when they had hopes of being able to move out, uh, they were smacked down by the rest of California. So this is the backdrop, you know, the, this is the, the simmering boiling pot of, of, of anger and frustration is, uh, you know, building up in Watts. And um, that um, comes to a head uh, in, on August 11th, 1965, a 21-year-old named Marquis Fry was pulled over, uh, reportedly for re reckless driving by California Highway Patrol. He was very near his house when this happened. Apparently, he was drunk driving. Um, that doesn't seem to be in dispute very much. Um, and his brother was in the car with him. And after he got pulled over, his brother ran over to go tell his mom, like right, just a couple blocks away, like, "Hey, um, uh, you know, Marquis, you know, w w was uh, you know, was pulled over for drunk driving." Um, the mom came out reportedly to yell at her son. She went to go, you know, give her son an earful for being, you know, so dumb to be drunk driving. Um, but when she showed up, the officers ha had apparently, you know, made a bunch of comments about her, called her some racist names. Um, this leads to some argument. Uh, people, more and more people kind of come out to see what's going on. The, the, the argument escalates. Uh, at some point, uh, you know, they, they, they a, a, a melee ensues between you know, the, the, the cops and people. Apparently one of the officers shoved Fry's mother to the ground. Um, and they fight, fighting at start. Rumor has it that a pregnant woman was kicked in the stomach by one of the police officers. Um, and as the police, uh, you know, they start arresting people and more and more people you know, are showing up. And the police arrest a bunch of people and get out. Uh, you know, they see this happening and extricate themselves and you know, arrest a few people um, and they're gone. But now you have this huge crowd of super pissed off people. You know, they, they feel like the cops just came in and beat the shit out of them for no reason and took off. Um, and this translates into rioting and violence. Uh, apparently, you know, it's sort of rumors spread about what happened. You know, stories, you know, get worse and worse. Uh, the first places that they start to attack are uh, white owned businesses in the neighborhoods. Um, there's lots of, you know, anger about, you know, the, the, like, you know, a lot of the businesses were stolen by white people and they feel like, oh, they charge us too much. Or, you know, that kind of thing. Those people follow me around the store. They don't trust me when I go in there. So, you know, the, all, all this whole racial anger is, you know, targeted those places. And that pretty much spreads through into everything getting attacked uh, relatively quickly. Um, within uh, the riot, it, uh, it spreads, Throughout, like throughout most of Watts and into other neighborhoods. It lasts for six days, um, which is just incredibly long time for just, you know, anarchy uh, in a major American city. Uh, the National Guard was called in. Um, the chief of police and the governor both described it in terms, this riot in terms of being a war zone and said, you know, they're going to use appropriate force to a war zone. Um, and uh, it's it's going to be just insane crackdown. 34 people would be killed during the riot. 23 of those people were uh, shot by law enforcement. Um, law enforcement was given orders to, you know, like, you know, try and take prisoners if you can. If not, you, you have permission to shoot. Um, uh, eventually, this sort of overwhelming uh, force will uh, get a, a, you know, there'll be a curfew imposed and they'll get... Um, 
order restored. Yeah, the police ended up arresting uh, 3,500 people, most of them for curfew violations. Um, but you know, is it this this you know last six days, 34 deaths, uh, over a thousand injuries, um, almost 3,500 arrests, 40 million dollars in property damage. Um, the uh, chief of police um, had been saying some uh, stuff I'm not going to repeat, pretty open about saying uh, about the, these type of people being, for, you know, living in a zoo, you know, calling certain animal names and uh, things like that. Uh, this is the same chief of police, like he, he uh, coined the term um, thin blue line. His name is William Parker. Uh, the thin, thin blue line, you know, basically the police are the only thing, you know, keeping society from reverting to anarchy. Um, and, you know, and that he felt, you know, they were going to draw a thin blue line around Watts. Um, and they, I mean, they already had, you know, been doing that and that's why this had been a problem. Um, so, um, you know, some of the pictures, if you just look up, um, uh, Watts riots, um, you, you just Google it and you'll see some insane, uh, pictures. And I feel like, you know, life is still going on. You see the, these, uh, these old ladies, you know, walking by uh, this ruined building in the, the upper left-hand corner, you know, people still have to live in this place um, afterward. Um, and, you know, things do not get better uh, after this. So, um, and I mean, I feel like I, you know, I, I should say that I'm not like, you know, I understand, you know, like I was saying that it, what they did was, you know, was right. You know, the, the, these are people destroying, you know, their own neighborhood by and large. I'm just putting this into context of understanding why they did it, why they were so, you know, frustrated. Um, when people are pushed to the brink, they will do crazy things. Um, so uh, one of the other major events that's gonna happen uh, in this era is, uh, that's really gonna spark a bunch of riots is the assassination of Martin Luther King. Um, that's the thing that uh, unfortunately I'm not uh, going to go into. I hope you guys all watch the video um, that I put up for the pop quiz about eyes on your prize. And King is not necessarily a central player in it, um, but he does definitely. You know, you see some rising speeches in him. Um, uh, I feel like that, that video is a sort of good bridge between the last lecture and this lecture. Um, but uh, King was assassinated in 1968. Uh, as far as we know, it really does seem to be like a lone gunman. There doesn't seem to be necessarily any conspiracy behind it. Um, and King did get many, many death threats. Um, but uh, he, when, we, when he died, it was, it was not just a huge blow to the black community. A lot of people had, you know, King was this beacon of hope, you know, this symbol of sort of goodness in the world, of kind of the best of us kind of thing. This, this man who would always turn the other cheek. Um, you know, had every reason to hate it and wish for violence, um, yet remained steadfast to the, you know, this, this, this message, the, you know, nonviolent resistance of peace and of unity, um, you know, had always, had, you know, had a, could quote the Bible, you know, with perfect, um, you know, the perfect verse for the perfect time, uh, you know, kind of thing. Um, and, you know, someone who just said, you know, we should all treat each other like human beings. And when he died, it really felt just like, like, if this guy can't even make it, make it in the world, if even this guy is killed, um, what, you know, what, what does that say about us? And definitely with the black community being like, well, you know, if, if they killed this guy, the most peaceful amongst us just for, you know, popping his head up and saying, let's go get along. Um, you know, we, we have, what hope do we have to make it in this country? Um, and, you know, his death, you know, directly sparked, riots across the country. Um, we, that's, if you Google 1968 uh, race riots, again, you, you, you just see some absolutely crazy pictures. Uh, uh, there's one in Baltimore in the lower left-hand corner always strikes me, this, you know, this National Guard has been just walking to his Jeep, you know, with this, uh, this you know, flaming uh, shot behind him. And it's just like, God, that's the United States. You know, that's just, it's just, it's just kind of crazy to contemplate. Um, and the sort of weirdly ironic thing that happens um, because of it, um, the, the writing just this keeps popping up. 
uh, in different places over the last few days, they die down, then it pops up in another city. Um, and it's seen as this real national crisis. Um, and legislators were, were pushed to, like, you have to do something. Uh, and this helps push the, the Fair Housing Act. It's also called the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Um, this is a, the, the next sort of big thing to happen after the 1964 Civil Rights Act um, that, you know, that hits more Americans. And this one is directly, you know, giving protection against discrimination in housing, you know, makes it a crime. Um, you know, basically all the stuff that the Rumford Act that it had here in California, it makes that a national U.S. policy. You can't discriminate in housing based on race, religion, color, national origin, anything like that. Um, and this bill got way more uh, pushback than even the 1964 Civil Rights Act did. Um, it was the most filibustered act in American history um, because this, you know, this was not a thing that, that, that just people in the South could all, you know, or people around the country could feel good about those, those horrible white racist Southerners who were segregationists. This was something that was going to allow black people to move into your, uh, you know, your Chicago suburban, uh, you know, neighborhood, um, you know, like, and lawmakers in Washington were definitely worried about that. Like, crap, if I vote for this, uh, you know, my constituents might vote me out. So you definitely had a lot, a lot of pushback uh, because of that. But just like the 1964 Civil Rights Act, um, it was only able to happen because of John F. Kennedy's assassination. Um, this was only happened because of Martin Luther King's assassination. It was seen as this, something that could be done to stop the rioting. And once it finally did pass, uh, it, it really did help the rioting co go down because all these people wanted was to be able to get out of these neighborhoods. So much of the writing is response to being stuck in ghettos. Uh, and this said, okay, now you have a chance to be able to get out of there. Federal law will protect you um, and be able to get out of there. And of course we know that's, you know, just because something's illegal doesn't mean that, you know, like it's not gonna happen. Um, well, just last year in Santa Rosa, I taught like a, a, a black student in my class said she, you know, her family when they first moved to Santa Rosa, um, they took a picture of her. They didn't take, they didn't, her family they didn't take pictures um, of other people that were there, but they took a picture of her family. And they said, oh, we're just doing this so we can keep track of the people. Uh, and of course they didn't get that house. And you know, for good reason, they're highly suspicious they didn't get it because they're black. Um, so it definitely still happens, but at least this puts the law on your side. You can, you, you can bring a, you know, if you know somebody's discriminating against you for these reasons, you can bring a lawsuit against them. It's difficult but it does offer some disincentive. Uh, okay, I'm going to take a break uh, now and uh, we'll pick up the second half in uh, just a moment. I'm still gonna break up these lectures because uh, I'm worried about losing half of it basically. So um, I'll be right back. <laughs> 